<laughs> get started with the road trip seminar. That was the introduction. Uh, next slide. All right. Uh, the sport of bowling is something that, uh, for Kaggle, is very, very important to us. Uh, our owner, John Davis, uh, one of the things that he says all the time, you know, is if you're creating the conditions of your bowling center and you're creating it for the recreational player, the open player, they don't need great lane conditions, they don't need great bowling balls, they both house shoes, they don't really know the difference between a, a well-maintained bowling center, right? But the sport players, you know, the players of bowl league and bowl tournaments, they certainly will know the difference. But if a recreational player is bowling in a sport maintained bowling center, if there are nice conditions, if the lanes are maintained, those sorts of things, they won't know the difference, right? That's fine for them. So the recreation can be played in a sport environment but the sport cannot be played in a recreational environment. So for us, the sport of bowling is at the heart of everything that we do at Kegel. Our mission statement is that we research the sport of bowling, and from that research, we develop products and services and everything else. So the primary, primary core of what we'll be talking about today is the sport of bowling. Without a sport of bowling, there's no need for USBC coaching, there's no need for technical people, there's no need for pro shops, no need for lane men, all of those things. Without the sport of bowling, the heartbeat of bowling stops, okay? All right, so why are we here together today? We decided that it was a good idea to get the pro shop operator and the lane man, proprietor, manager in the same room. Some might think this is a bit risky. These guys get mad at, you, at each other from, uh, from time to time or blame each other. You know, when the bowler doesn't bowl bad, you know, is it the pro shop's fault, you know, that he drilled the ball wrong, or is it the lane man's fault that he did the lanes wrong that night, you know? But these two guys are it, arguably the two most important people in the bowling center when it comes to customer satisfaction, as far as his bowling ball doing what he wants his bowling ball to do, his scores being what he wants his scores to be, uh, et cetera. All right, so these are the two most important people. We felt that it would make a lot of sense to do some cross-training. We normally, at our seminars for lane maintenance, have lane men. And a volleyball company, they have pro shops at their, at their seminars. So we said, let's, let's train them. It would be great if a pro shop can come and learn all the things that we teach about lane maintenance. This would help him do his job better. This would help him understand more about lane patterns, ball reaction, et cetera, and vice versa. If the lane man were to learn more about everything that the pro shops are doing. Pin in, pin out, top weights, surface, all of those sorts of things, he would have a greater understanding and help him do his job better. So that's the, the basic premise of why we, we got together here. So we're going to share things the lane man has to take into account when conditioning lanes. We're also going to share what a pro shop operator has to take into account when suggesting bowling balls to their customers. And we're going to share how some things are beyond everybody's control. And we'll also show solutions to issues you may not know that you have. Okay, next slide. All right, so we thought it'd be fun to, to just do a quick little survey and just get an idea of what the pro shop operators think about the lane men, you know, and then ask them some questions. And vice versa, let's call some lane men and let's ask them what they think about their pro shop operator. So we called 50 of each. We asked them some questions, and these are some of the responses we got. You know, some of them are, are pretty predictable, others are pretty funny. So we asked 50 pro shop operators, do you help the bowlers adjust to the lane pattern, or do you feel the lane man should adjust the pattern to fit your bowlers? All right? Now think about how many different variety of styles of bowlers are in our bowling center. It's pretty challenging. But we asked that question, and these were a few of the responses that we received. The pro shop says, I do what I can, but I would say they adjust to the bowlers. Always have to try to make the bowlers happy. The second person says, the lane man does what I say, what I tell him to do. That's healthy. All right. The third one says, our bowlers are scoring so high, everything's just basically staying status quo. All right. Conversely, we talked to the lane man and asked him, do you adjust the pattern to the bowler? Or do you expect that the bowler should have some adjustments uh, in their approach to the lane pattern? 
First answer is, if the bowlers are not striking, then I am expected to make adjustments. But you don't see them moving the fence up at Fenway when no home runs are getting hit. <laughs> Wouldn't it be the fence down, though, actually? <laughs> and that's what he said. We had to put his quote in there. All right, number two. I say I change the pattern, but I don't. <laughs> I, I know it seems like that might be tricky, guys, but believe it or not, the more you keep things the same, the more it allows uh, the bowlers to actually get used to what they're seeing there. You know, when you're changing it all the time to try to correct it for this guy's complaint or this guy's complaint, it's really an endless chase. You know? So really uh, one of the best things that we can do when we make changes to someone's lane pattern, you know, keep it that way for a while. Let them have a chance to really uh, get adjusted to it. And the third one says, when the moaning gets out of control, I definitely will try to make some minor adjustments. All right? Okay. So uh, the theme of our seminar tour is the Kaggle Storm Road Trip. We started, you know, we were going on a road trip, so that made a lot of sense. Uh, we have uh, the navigation patterns, which all carry road names. And Storm has a series of bowling balls that have some road names. You know, the High Road and T Road. T -road and Third Road, uh, Thunder Road, and all these roads. So we had this, uh, this synergy in roads, and we started thinking about roads. And we're like, you know, lanes, when you bowl at different bowling centers, are kind of like traveling down different roads. And the bowler is kind of like the driver of a car, you know, and the car is the bowling ball, you know, and the surface of the bowling ball is tires. So there's really some uh, a kind of a cool uh, story to be told. So. That's the, the basic theme of, of the seminar tour. So we're going to show you some different roads. Have an idea if, if you've, in your bowling life, bowled on some roads that might look like this, or bowled on some lanes that might uh, reflect these roads. This is a gorgeous road. Nice and straight, just been paved, go really fast, not a care in the world. Have we all bowled on some roads that are pretty easy? Lanes on some, that are pretty easy? All right. <laughs> Good. Come on. <laughs> what? Oh, the, yes. Okay, so we all agree we bowled on a road, a lane that, that reflects this type of road. Let's look at some more types of roads I think that we all see we might have encountered at some type in our bowling career. Road number two, a real dirt road, right? You know, it hooks a lot, you would think, right? And you might have to have a different type of tire, different type of car to travel on this road, all right, and to be uh, more effective. I don't think my car will work on that. How about this road? You know, it's got wet water everywhere, potholes, you know. I think we've all bowled on, on our, our lanes that, that are kind of like that road. Then we got this one, look at this. You know, nasty, this was paved in like 1960, cracks everywhere. I think we've been into those bowling centers that, that look kind of like that. Or this one. Or this road. Icy, slick, got a little bit of a hill. Really, really got to be quite careful when traveling down, down this road. If you don't have the right equipment on the right road, if you're not matched up correctly, you could get stuck like, you know, these poor girls, you know, stuck in the snow. They need some help. I, I would help them, though, if I saw them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the road less traveled. All right, so this is a, a book that we found in our research. It's the Standard Rules for Bowling in the United States, the eighth edition written in 1892, eighth edition, okay? And they talk about lots of things and different rules, and one of the rules, uh, it has to do with lane conditions. So we thought it was, was really a very interesting passage and kind of tells a nice story of where they were and, and kind of where we are today. I'll read it to you. It says, in the first place, the conditions of the alley have to be perfect, neither too slippery from having just been cleaned and oiled nor rough and dirty, owing to lack of such attention. If too slippery, the ball will not hold on the wood sufficiently, and therefore the effect of the twist will be lost, and Del Warren cannot hook the ball at all. <laughs> all right. And vice versa, if the alleys be not properly cleaned, the ball will obtain too great a hold, and too much curve will result. So therefore, it can readily be seen that the player to be uniformly successful should place his full reliance upon a straight delivery without a semblance of twist or curve. <laughs> kind of neat. Walter Ray, Norm Duke, Del Warren. Some examples. Del Warren. <laughs> <laughs> Not Chris Chartrand. <laughs> right. but, but think about this. This is 100 and, 
18 years ago. Were they complaining about lane conditions 118 years ago? <laughs> Sounds like it. <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> this is a, a very interesting uh, slide. It's, it's, it's you know, an exaggerated visual, but it actually <clears throat> demonstrates a very important point. When people think about lane conditions, the first thing, and in many cases the only thing, that people think about when they think about how are the lane conditions today? They're thinking about lane oil. Are they slick today? Are they hooking more today? Do they change a lot today? Are they easy today? Are they hard today? And when everyone is thinking about lane conditions, they're just thinking about lane oil. Okay? Now, lane oil is certainly a component of the overall puzzle that actually produces what the lane conditions are like. But it's not the only puzzle, piece of the puzzle. There are many other pieces to the puzzle that contribute to what the lane conditions are like that day. And so we're going to talk about the lane patterns, but we're also going to talk about all of the other things that many people aren't aware of that contributes to whether the lanes are easy, whether they hook a little bit more, whether they can strike, whether they can carry when they hit the pocket. All right, so it's not just lane on, okay? All right, um, this is a, a tool that's very, very important. Um, it's a tool called the, uh, the lane monitor, and it's a tool that measures the amount of oil that's on the lane. Now, in every uh, batch of lane conditioner that's made today, uh, all manufacturers are required to put some UV in the lane conditioner, a very set amount of UV. Based on that UV, this actually traps uh, the oil between two pieces of tape and it reads the amount of UV. So it's not reading the volume of the oil, it reads that UV. But, and it gives us basically a picture of what the graph of the lane oil looks like. It's, it's excellent to show the shape of the pattern, excellent to show depletion, how much oil was in the pattern before we started and how much we got left after bowling is done. And it's excellent, very, very good to show consistency from day to day, consistency from squad to squad, okay? So what we wanted to do, we all know that lane conditions change. The lane man makes a decision and puts a pattern in, okay? That's one decision that the lane man has made. Then after that, many other people come on the lanes and start bowling, and they start making decisions. They start deciding where they're going to stand. They decide what bowling ball they're going to pull out of their bag, where they're going to throw that bowling ball, what release they're going to throw that bowling ball with. And all of those decisions influence how that lane pattern morphs and what it turns into after practice, after one game, after three games. Okay? And based on those decisions, the lanes can actually change and get easier for some or difficult for others. And these are all based on decisions that are all in the hands of the bowlers. Let's, let's say the ball you should be throwing only has one piece of tape in it, your thumb is swelled, but you can't take that piece of tape out because it's hot outside and you've had the ball in your trunk. And if you take that piece of tape out, you're going to have the tape glue on there. So you can't throw that ball. So you have to throw a different ball and play in a completely different part of the lane. That's a decision. It's something that's happened. Or you buy a new one and you want to throw it because it's new, even though you shouldn't be throwing that bowling ball. All the decisions that happen on a regular basis that all affect what's going to happen to the lane pattern. Okay, so what we did, we've, uh, in many tournaments that we've done, had the pre-tournament graph and the after-tournament graph. We actually wanted to have a real-time picture of how the pattern is changing, all right, and how the oil is being, being uh, removed from the lane, how much is being removed from the lane. So we actually bowled a match. There was, uh, Storm was nice enough to send uh, some of their staff down, right on page, Norm Duke, Pete Weber, and their anchor bowler, Victor Marion from Storm. <laughs> and on Team Kaggle, we had uh, myself, clearly the first person. Too old. Huh? The too, too old? Too old. <laughs> yeah, the too old. Uh, Terrence Reeves, uh, Mike Birdie, and one lefty. So each team had three righties and one lefty, and we bowled three games lead. We practiced and bowled three games. All right? And we stopped and we took tapes after halfway through game one, the end of game one, halfway through game two and a game two and so on to have a much more real-time picture of how the pattern is breaking down. Okay? We'll show you what the graph looks like. There they are. Look at these teams. Of course we had to have a friendly gentleman's wager. <laughs> Clearly Kegel had the advantage in this match, you know, with Chris and Mike against Pete Weber and Norm Duke and Victor Marion. Really tipped the scales. You know. We won one Kegel won one out of three. That's, 
All right, this is the pre-graph. All right, we're going to uh, click it and show you. I'll, I'll let you know where it is as it's breaking, uh, breaking down. Well, it's halfway through game one. After game one, one and a half, two, two and a half games, and three. An amazing punch play it just one more time. All right, fascinating. Now we're going to uh, go game by game and actually quantify in exact percentages how much oil was removed uh, after each game. So this is before we start. Fresh pattern, no bowling yet, no depletion. So after game one, over 35% of the oil that had been applied, gone, after one game, okay? After two games, over half of the oil had been removed. And after three games, 60 plus percent of the oil had been removed, okay? Now in terms of percentages, this is a four man lead, basically, and there's one lefty and three rights. Comparatively speaking to if you were bowling in a five-man lead and you had five righties on each